Hats? Hang on, I need to burp. Hey, I'm in. Hats? Oh yeah, we're on the way to Nando Holiday Road. <laughs> there you go. All right, so we uh, seem to be on the road again, and, and I have no on idea if, if this uh, audio is going to be as atrocious as Marundi, but I've made a few adjustments on this little thing. Um, you want to tell people where we are headed for episode 22? 22. Um, we are headed, well, what can I say? We are headed to northern New South Wales to a farm. Yes, I don't yes. I don't know what all we can say because I've done what all we can say because we've, no, well, we've still got to meet the guy. We've met the guy before, but well, I just want to confirm what he's comfortable with. But we are Northern New South Wales to a cow farm. We can say that. That's not too doxy. Is that the technical term? A cow I would farm? Say cat, maybe cattle farm? Yeah, I would imagine it's a cattle farm. It's a cow. Everybody knows what. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a cattle a farm. A cow farm. Jesus. Hang on. You, tur- you turned up in thongs. I knew you would do this. <laughs> I knew it. Um, I'm Australian. <laughs> All right, we're going to we're going to a cattle farm, and Brendo is wearing his thongs, and it's really wet. <laughs> so hats it's been raining all month, yeah. and you're in your thongs. That's all right. It, anyway. um, I won't get wet shoes then. Mm-hmm. But hats actually made me go back home and grab some boots, some gum boots. So they're in the back of the car as well. Um, but who knows? You know, maybe. Wellies. They're not gum boots. They're wellies. Oh, wellies. You know what wellies are? Nobody will know what wellies are. Yeah, Wellingtons. Yeah, okay, well, you do know what they yeah. Paddington Bear wears them. Yeah, Wellingtons, exactly. Wellies. Yeah. Gumboots, stupid name. Paddington Bear is a child's story. Yeah, and you're not a child? No. Okay. Um, yeah, right, okay, so this is, uh, what, an hour and a half? Uh, yeah, something like that. Maybe, to go. Um, really looking forward to it. Um, yes. Hopefully we don't get bogged in the mud somewhere. My car. No, we're taking my car, right? We should have taken your car. The um, well, I, I actually, you know, when we were deciding which car, I looked at both of our tires and I went, "Oh, yours are a bit bigger than mine, so we should take yours." Oh, you never mentioned that. All right, okay, fair enough. So we, okay, um, if this is so, this is what's good about this is we have done. This will be our well, sort of third in person, but this is the first. Yeah, because we whiz and also and also the guys at Marundi. Oh yeah, true. Uh, um, but this has been the first one we've actually gone to somebody to their thing, so that's cool. I, I'm really excited by that. Like I'm, I'm not like I grew up in the countryside, but I am by no stretch a farmer, and I don't know anything. So we're going to sound particularly idiotic in this one. Um, I'm actually looking forward to if there's uh, any blowflies around, and, and just to see how you freak out. Oh yeah, shit! I don't like flies. You don't like anything. I don't, I don't like anything. You're right. Um, all right, cool. Um, but yeah, about an hour and a half, and and then we'll we'll be back. Go. Cool. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. Hats. Are we going? Yes. Randall, how are you? I am very well. What's going on? Where are we? We, we made it. We are in um, mid-north coast, New South Wales. Inland a little bit. Inland a little bit on the farm with Owen. Hi Owen, how are you doing? Very well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. Not at all. Thanks for having us to the house. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about your personal story, but then also talk about the farm um, and then also talk about what you think about future and anything you want to touch on on just Bitcoin and generally. Um, so, but first of all, because you've you've just told me that you had to spend a bit of time time in Thailand, I'm just going to do a price stamp in Thailand because we think Bitcoin is for everyone. So, uh, oh, one, cool, yeah, yeah, it'll be like a million and something, I guess. Yeah, one point five three six seven nine four just jumped massively, point something two nine um, up point one four percent on the day. So we're having a bit of a downturn just now, but. Thailand's doing okay. So, um, yeah, so could you talk us through a little bit uh, pre-Bitcoin um, and your previous career, if you're however much you're willing to talk, talk about, um, and then we'll, we'll go into the, the transition into what you're doing now. Yeah, sure. That'd be great. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, thanks for having me on. It's great to have you guys here. I'm keen to show you around the farm a little bit later. Uh, met you guys down at the Bush Bash, uh, which was awesome. Um, yeah, I was, um, some of your listeners might've seen me back when I was sort of on Twitter, um, under my full name and 
talking about all sorts of stuff and getting learning about Bitcoin and then but I've gone a bit quiet and having my account suspended was part of that but um, <laughs> getting <laughs> going a bit quiet um, and been hanging out on the farm here for the last year and I'm um, pretty excited to be fulfilling some dreams here in terms of doing some organic and regenerative farming um, producing some good beef but yeah I worked in uh, organic farming mostly in certification and regulation stuff for on and off for the last 20 years really and all, that all in Australia no I was very fortunate to be able and this leads well into how I got into Bitcoin I traveled extensively through Southeast Asia especially and the Pacific and um, um, so I s- was able to meet that that was to do, that was visiting organic farms mostly um, mm. doing organic inspections on farms so um, went eventually did 35 countries so over the last five years up until this year I was overseas most of the time and um, going to lots of different places, developing countries especially, and seeing how people's understanding of money worked, like, uh, and seeing how the currency changed. Like one one example is going to Burma, to Myanmar, and I went several years in a row, and and it's you know it only had just opened up recently, Myanmar, and developing rapidly, but no credit systems there yet like people don't know what a credit card what they're starting to learn now and don't really understand how that works and a currency that's just devaluing terribly i don't know what it's at now i haven't looked recently but i brought some cash home accidentally from from myanmar on my first visit the the jiat um because you couldn't change it and i didn't realize you couldn't change the currency you at that point i don't know if you can now but you couldn't change myanmar jiats outside of the country so it's a totally closed currency okay so I accidentally had a few thousand jets and I took them back next year and the value had dropped by half. Oh, wow. So that was one little so example. What do, so what do people do in country? What do locals do? Well, they carry shopping bags full of paper money. Yeah. But do they, <laughs> so hang on, they, but they can transfer to other currencies in country? Uh, or you, or you no. Can, really? Well, I don't know. They use US dollars there a lot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yes, you can do currency exchange inside the country. Yeah. yeah. So basically what you're saying is um, that people instinctively understand that the value of their currency is going down yeah and they and they, and they talk in us dollars they yeah. go to whatever they feel is the stronger thing for them to hold yeah exactly you would the same see, as we had from you know turkey people from lira go to gold and us dollar it sounds the same yeah camilla colombia colombia absolutely yep. so people are people instinctively get this we might not get it in australia and it was um, only by coming home and waiting a whole year and then going back and and then realizing that it had mm. devalued by the full 50 percent in that time in so 12, 12 months yeah it was, it was roughly that yeah yeah and because we are not seeing that that well we might be seeing it soon but we're not <laughs> we haven't seen it in you know any of these living memory particularly um in a country like australia um people are not as aware so i've been talking about this quite a lot recently as we have to be th- these are these sort of situations are um leading indicators of where we are going yeah people should be paying attention yeah yeah Sorry, no, I and i literally I literally saw people carrying shopping bags full of cash. Like that's how they would do big transactions there when I first started going to Myanmar. And in later years, that's when credit systems started opening up and they had all, all these incentive schemes for to get people to start using credit cards, including big discounts at vendors, like 10% off at vendors if you use the credit card. And no interest was being charged initially. But these people just didn't... It's just a totally new concept that, mm. that, of credit. So yeah. I think they're all going to end up in heaps of debt and that's how the economy will grow there. But yeah, that was just one little touch point for during my travels and other examples are when I spent a lot of time in the Pacific as well and in Vanuatu um, while I was there one year in Vanuatu they were changing the coins so changing the coinage and everyone was talking about it because they only had um, a certain amount of time to bring in the old coins and it was pretty short deadline so there were were like villages um, and tribesmen coming in from the remote islands because Vanuatu has like 83 islands or something uh, with backpacks full of coins that they had dug up like they had them in a crate buried yeah. and they dug them up to take them back to get the new coins to create the new coinage wow. um and just the, and the some of the some of the um another one in vanuatu that was related to money that got me thinking about it was um they would uh, world vision had done some good stuff and some less good stuff over there but one of the things they did was a savings account for uh, uh, one community and there would be literally a box that they'd put the money in and usually they were saving for school fees that was the main thing because they don't really need money otherwise they've mm. got everything they need is just outside they've got the pandanus and the, they've got the coconuts and they've got food everywhere um, 
for the most part in in Vanuatu. Um, so, but the money is for the school fees. So they so they do have a job here and there, and they save up when they can, and they put the money into this vault, which had two keys, and the two village chiefs would have a separate key. So I'm like, wow, <laughs> it's multi-sig. a multi <laughs> multi sig vault, the original. Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, sorry, can you date that for me? When was that? Um, this is really recent. There's there's still there's probably still projects like that happening. Mm. Sort of, um, I was there um, between five, yeah, about five years ago. Over the last over the last sort of seven years, I was doing all the travel. The last couple of years, obviously, I've stayed in Australia. Yeah, yeah. So, have you always had an interest in sort of money and economics? Then, like, well, kind of. Um, I always had a good bullshit filter, like I and was always looking into things further. I was a bit of a smart ass kid at school and uni, and wanted to look into things and um and farming i studied agriculture so and learning about agriculture how convent, conventional in inverted commas um modern maybe you should say um agriculture was was uh, a lot of it was sort of seemed like a scam to me like you would end up having to use more and more synthetic chemicals and you'd end up in a contract to have to buy seed again next year and it all this seemed like a scam and so i was you know into organic farming um so um the economics no i wasn't that interested in, in in uni really um but as i sort of started scratching deeper and deeper and obviously came around to the conclusion that bitcoin is or the money is the 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 main the underlying problem with so many of the world's problems um so focusing on fixing farming or focusing on fixing social aspects uh it's just never going to work because we've got a broken money um underneath so the interest in economics came later once i'd gone through sort of phases of of interest in what what the biggest problems in the world were mm. and um although there's a bit of a background with money like um, my grandfather was campaigning for monetary system reform i found this out later and he used to, he had these pamphlets in his garage that were all about how there was one called treasure island which was this little brochure you, you can find it online it's um uh, uh where some guy they, they all end up on a desert deserted island and and they're like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And and uh, and then a banker arrives and he's like, it's all right. I've got a, a barrel full of gold. Well, I'll bury it here and I'll issue you these notes. And it's this whole comic about it. And yeah. I remember seeing it when I was a kid. I didn't know what it was about. It was a really boring comic. Yeah. But um, this was produced by some Canadian group in the 60s. And yeah. it, was, it was all for monetary system reform. So I don't know what my grandfather would have thought of Bitcoin. Maybe. So maybe I'm building on his work. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know if you saw the thing recently with Canada um, where they... Uh the level of debt under Trudeau is now greater than the level of debt under all exist all previous prime ministers. <laughs> so it just shows you that this, this is a problem that's been it's just come, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Um, so we are, uh, yeah, it's it's so it goes from manageable to less manageable to less manageable, and people get more and more distressed because of it. And it's getting now to the point where it's really significant for a lot of people in, and it's not, but it's not happening in our country first. It's been to, it's happening probably in the, some of these countries you visited. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean the the money system is like at its base just totally a scam. So and it it you have to create more to ever be able to pay off the interest on the last bit that was created. So I got really interested in that as the biggest scam that I'd ever found uh, was basically fractional central banking and fractional reserve banking. Um, so uh, the the and I was interested in that because I was watching shows like and coming back to my travel. Like another thing that all that travel involved was a lot of time in hotel rooms mm. in, in Asia in the Pacific and I, where you get RT I don't know if you watch much RT Russia Today oh, yeah. apparently it's the world's most watched TV station it's broadcast in Spanish and French and, and English and, and whatever so and on there so this, that's Max Kaiser yeah, Kaiser the, yeah was, the yeah, Kaiser Report yeah. so I started watching the Kaiser Report in like 2015 mm -hmm. and, and I just loved it just soaked it up it was like markets finance scandal and just uh, which is their, their slogan and um and then that's where I started hearing about Bitcoin, and and then when I looked into Bitcoin, I was like, oh, this is the, this is the answer. It was just so obvious that that's what I've been thinking about central banking and fractional reserve banking for a few years, and then and then found Bitcoin, and it was very quickly very clear that that it had the power to to fix all these problems. Mm. Mm. In very true Bitcoiner fashion, we, when we've skipped straight over the regenerative <laughs> farming, and gone straight to money in Bitcoin. Sorry, yeah, that was. So, um, oh no, I'm still talking about my history about how I got oh, to okay, here. Okay, so we're right, getting right, there. I'm just doing it a long, <laughs> long-winded way. Um, um, yeah. So also it, with the travel, like Papua New Guinea, it was interesting. They still use well, mostly for ceremonial purposes, but they still store value in pig tusks and in shells in Papua New Guinea. Really, that was fascinating to see. Pig tusks. Pig tusks. They've wow. got a pig tusk central bank on because <laughs> um, they're scarce. Or yeah, yeah, well, you've got to grow a pig, right? Right. Yeah. So that takes ages. And low, low time yeah, problems. Yeah, it's absolutely proof of work. And yeah. the shell money, the 
PNG shell money is the same. It's the carry shell. So they're hard to catch and they're limited in supply. And then you have to actually polish them and work them in a oh, certain wow. way. So the ladies sit down and do that for days and end up making a uh, ceremonial, but also very much a value for, for dowry and stuff like that. Um, but the pig tusks, yeah, that would apparently that evolved from a live pig being a, a, a proof of work, a way to pay for something. Um, and then it sort of became a bit more symbolic. It was like actually the the monetary premium in that pig's worth more than all the meat and stuff hanging off it. Really, really what we're talking about is the work that went into that pig and that can be pre- represented by the length of the tusk. Mm. So the tusks became the money. Yeah, wow. Well. Yeah, and that, they're still in use. I just found that fascinating. So the tusk is the blockchain. Yep. Right? <laughs> like how many blocks is in a tusk? Right? That's what it is. Well, they could be very scarce on these islands too. Like there would be not many pigs on these islands. So that's how... That's, that they valued this uh, pig tusk central bank at so many billion US some, some years ago. Really? And then, and then I heard the terrible talk of... They were talking about trying to peg it to the to the Vanuatu um, currency, which I was like, no. But uh, yeah, so... They start um, printing pictures of tusks. So your economics um, interest, um, was that... So that's also... that's also The ag stuff, some of that was university, but the economic stuff is self-taught? Really came after, after, after yeah, self-taught, yeah. Yep. And using, doing safety and course and just, uh, just consuming podcasts like crazy. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, I was going to... I haven't really answered your question, have I? I'm completely okay, go, go your own way. It's um, fine. Yeah, how do we get to here? How do we get to here? So that's more how I got into Bitcoin. Um, but I always had that interest in farming. Yep. And um, I you was... from a, fa- a family of farmers? Just small farms. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, never really very commercial. Um, so hopefully I can be actually commercial and successful on this one. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, yeah, always had the dream of doing some farming. This was actually plan B though. So I was going to, um, at the start of 2020, I was going to move to Thailand and I'd had great plans of using that as my base and go to a bunch of um, Bitcoin conferences around the world. I already had my schedule planned out for 2020, uh-huh. going to all the different conferences. And of course that, and I was in Asia in February, 2020 when uh, all this COVID stuff uh, happened and I was uh, made the decision to stay here in Australia rather than go to Thailand at that point. I'm not ruling out leaving the country, um, that's for sure, especially depending how the our authoritarian government go. But this, uh, and I was going to do some organic farming over there, but um, instead I made the decision just a year ago to, to buy this place and give it a go here. Yeah. So, so yeah, I've got this small, just 13 acres here, uh, not far from the coast, so good rainfall and, and raising some cattle and and uh, chickens and doing a bit of gardening and and getting involved in the community and trying to um, teach people who are interested about Bitcoin locally as well, which is good. It's a pretty alternative community here, so it's going well. And not not only is it a beautiful place, it's got a lovely breeze and the smell that is coming out of that oven. Oh, that's what I said. It's a beautiful uh, scenery, but the standing downwind of the oven is the place to be. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, brisket. That's your own? Um, yeah, yeah, that's okay. w- he was processed uh, a few months ago. So I'm getting down to the lower end of the freezer from the last uh, animal we processed. So the the briskets are at the bottom, but that's going to be good. So it should be ready in uh, an hour or so. Yes. Right, excellent, excellent. <laughs> All right, what else? Do we want to go on, on a tour? Or like, have you got more to say about your kind of background sure or? no i'll show you around that'd be good uh, we've had a lot going on here so um you've been planting some trees and things it looks like yeah you're... so we're doing uh, a heap of tree planting the place has been pretty bare or was was pretty bare when i got it so there's not a lot of shade for the cattle um not a lot of wind break um so i um have found a local designer to help me and we put together a plan for pretty extensive tree planting on the place so putting in about a thousand trees and uh, which is good we did that as a community exercise as well so we had like 18 people locally just come around and uh, which was really nice to get to know the community get tight with the neighbors how does that work i mean how did how do 18 people arrive that was just here. friends of friends um we were going to do a bigger one through the land care but it was sort of getting delayed and i really wanted to get them in the ground so i just kind of we, we figured we just need 10 or 20 people and i sort of counted up just people i know and we're able to get that many so and good. that all somebody will call and one day you'll go to theirs or oh, you've, already, you've yeah. done that already or yeah no that's definitely how it works around here it's a great community it's really surprising how how supportive people are They're really welcoming um so even though there's much fewer people perhaps because of there's so fewer people here than in a major town or major city people seem to genuinely care about you 
and it's been pretty welcoming. There are a few exceptions. There are a few old timers who have just told me to fuck off to mm -hmm. where I where I came from. But for the most part, everyone's been really welcoming and supportive. And if you help them out, they'll help you out. And yeah, there's food everywhere, and there's always little social gatherings, and there's yoga in the hills, which is lockdown resistant and uh, <laughs> stuff like that. So yeah, it's a good place to be. But yeah, let's check it out. Let's go for a wander. Awesome. All right, so uh, we're kind of uh, moving. Are you this time? Are you... Yes, I'm yes. recording this time. <laughs> Hats has decided he wants to check out uh, this little area but on the way to the dam. Where are we, Hats? Uh, we're at the veggie patch um, and flowers, and I just want to know what's here. Yeah, go on. So what what is this, Owen? Yeah, this is Mum's garden. Um, Mum's got I've got a caravan on here for Mum. She comes and visits, which is great. And so she's got a bunch of I don't actually eat veggies myself, but. Um, it is good to have this garden though, especially for when guests are here. So we've got cucumbers and capsicum and kale. The kale's a bit late, it's getting a bit hot for that, but it, actually it's pulling through all right. And a bunch of herbs and flowers and um, is, other stuff here. Is that corn over there? Yeah, that's my garden, which looks a lot worse as you can see. And I just grew zucchini and squash and corn. There's still quite a bit of corn coming on because I planted it in you know, over, over a period of weeks. So there's still some corn cobs almost ready. Yep. Um, so vegetables, can you tell me you don't really eat vegetables? You, you have to talk about that? Yeah, so I've not really eaten vegetables for four years now. Um, I kind of had some health problems and gradually moved on to paleo and then went sort of keto and then eventually ended up in basically carnivore and it just works very well for me. I think I'm fitter and healthier than I've ever been and if I eat veggies for a few days in a row I get joint pain in, in my knuckles and toes and so as yeah the, there's a lot of poisonous stuff in all plants like of all the plants that are out there there's a tiny tiny percentage that we can eat and even those ones are still poisonous to a different extent to, to different extents and it's like oxalates and lectins and isothiocyanates and all these uh, poisons that are in plants and you can cook them out um, as or soak them out to an extent but really animal protein animal fats where it's at so that that raw vegetable argument that's not not particularly valid you know i think i think that's like just a terrible diet people i see people putting kale into smoothies and stuff and and it can actually like it can give you kidney stones and severe problems uh, for some people um, others other people seem to be able to cope with it but i definitely can't were you fully aware of um the the eating the vegetables and immediately feeling the problem like how, how did it take you a long time to realize what it was or there's a bit of a lag time with my symptoms. It's about three days of eating vegetables. Yeah, so. yeah, like I'm sore all the time and I eat lots of veggies. Dude, if you have any ailment, the, the, there's a very safe um, uh, modification that you can do and that's going carnivore and try it for two weeks or try it for four weeks if you can and to see what happens. It's, it's perfectly safe to completely delete plants from your diet and just live on steak and eggs. Uh, you won't have any, all that vitamin C and fiber and all that, you don't need any of that. Um, so it's worth a try if you've got problems. If you don't have problems, then don't don't uh, feel like you're being having it pushed upon you. But for anything like inflammatory or um, pain, arthritic pain or dig digestive as well, um, carnivore diet's incredible. Yeah, right. So, I've got lots of problems. Just ask hats. <laughs> yeah, you do have a lot of problems. Not all to do with your diet, but um, you yeah, know, I uh, I uh, recently just went towards biltong as snacking. And um, yeah, I've lost a bit of weight, and I do feel better. Energy levels are higher. I don't I, like. I was very. I was probably see all this stuff on Twitter and seeing. You know, maybe thought it was a bit of a, you know, the state cult or whatever. And I thought, oh, I don't know if I'm going to join that. And then you you ref, you sort of reject, 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 you re reject. And then you go, well, these guys were right about some things. So let's give it a go. Now I don't know. I have, I have no idea. But I've, I, I'm, that's what I'm doing now. Chewing biltong as a snack, and I feel better. I lost a little bit of weight, and I feel better. So I I don't know. Let's just keep going. Jerky. Jerky is the ultimate snack for long drives or something. All you need is jerky. Um, but yeah, the it, it's totally a fad. Um, mm. Like keto was a fad and paleo was a fad. Um, but uh, yeah, it doesn't mean there's not some good uh, signal in there. And it was, um, so four years ago when I first tried it, it was uh, guys like Saifedine and Jordan Peterson and various uh, and Michael Goldstein, like these guys from different spaces that I was following on Twitter um, from different areas of expertise, I mean, who were all doing this thing. And they were some of the smartest people I'd ever come across in my life. And I'm like, why are they all doing this? And uh, yeah. that helped uh, lean me towards giving it a try. And then, and then, um, yeah, it's, it's been good. Did you do like jerky or anything yourself? No, I haven't made any jerky, but I definitely want to. 
course there as, as you're about to see we're um, processing beef here for, for ourselves and friends and family and uh, that's um, so I've got a big freezer and a backup generator in case and um, processing a, a beast every every month or two or three and uh, jerky something I definitely want to get into making sweet all right what's next okay uh, the boundary just there yeah so i have a neighbor funnily enough i have the most one of the most chemical intensive neighbors and i'm an organic or slash regenerative or whatever you want to call it kind of guy but um and next door as as luck would as fate would have it i have a a fairly uh conventional neighbor next door but that's all right do you get nervous when the breeze is up uh not really there was one time when he was spraying and it was coming directly into the house and i had guests and i lost lost my shit at him and we've been getting along a lot better since then <laughs> okay. awesome. so, is this this is 100 percent of your time or are you still working in fiat world as well yeah i've still got some consulting work to bring a bit of cash in this is not yet a profitable operation but hopefully one day i might need to add chickens to the mix uh, egg production uh, regener eggs so because that'll work in really well with the grazing rotation here it's a perfect farm for, for producing some eggs so uh, I'm just trying to work out whether to make that capital investment and and find a good uh, staff member to so that I don't have to personally collect eggs every day uh, is regener eggs your term because that's bloody awesome uh, thank you yes it's one of mine it's trademarked no it's not but uh, <laughs> please don't steal it that's yeah regener eggs and beef back better are my two brand names there is a guy, there's a guy, or guys near where we are that build things called chicken caravans. Yeah. Have you, yeah, seen, yeah. The chi- have you seen the chicken caravan? Yeah, I'd love, I'd love um, a couple of those basically, but um, they're quite expensive. They are really good. But the, um, they mo- that, the idea is they, sorry, the idea is they move around the farm, basically. Yeah, that's how I'll do it. I'll, the, the chickens will follow this. So we're just down here near the, near the cattle now. Uh, they're all camp. They're all sitting down, which is pretty good for mid morning. It means they're well fed. Some of them are uh, shooing some buffalo fly. There's a few about at the moment. You can see some of their uh, shooing with their tails. But what about the scratching the head on the tree? Is that a similar thing, or is it just itchy? Ah, uh, Rudy just likes to do that. They love scratching their head and their neck on stuff. If you put any sort of any logs or stumps, or I was digging some holes for the tree planting the other day, and he went straight in there, started rubbing his head, and then getting right down on his stomach and rubbing his neck in the soil so yeah it's just one of the natural cow behaviors that's awesome so uh, which one are you eating next uh that little one oh is that him yeah so he's the, the first one there basically so belted galloway he's still only small to medium he's the closest one here facing side on there what's his name uh he doesn't have a name he's just number two oh. he was only the second steer can, on I, can I name him yeah, sure, that's fine. Hats. <laughs> Hats has got a limited uh, lifespan left. Then. Uh, I might show you, I'll show you the bit of the tree planting here. Yeah, sure. No, sorry. Yeah, I mean, so you've got 13 acres. Um, how many cattle can you keep on 13 acres in this sort of country? I've got 12 head at the moment, um, which is a little on the high side and I'll destock a bit through winter. So we have summer dominant rain here and there's just stacks of feed now, but in the winter you can run short of feed. So I'll probably reduce that back down to about half that number uh, or get some more land if I can rent, lease or just some more land in the area. Um, no, that's fine. No, yeah. uh, hats? no, go for it. Um, so what was I going to say? You just, oh, if I don't turn around, that's a good idea. Um, you, the idea is you don't ever want to be having to bring in feed to feed them. You want to be off your own land, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's um, Even during the driest period in the winter, you don't want to have to buy feed. Well, for my sort of setup, because feed's very expensive. So I'd rather destock and have enough feed without bringing it in or you end up going broke pretty quickly. And uh, in terms of your neighbours, um, is there... Do you share land? Can you... Um, do, could you, like, you know, adjustment and things like that? Could you do that? Or do people want to do that with you? I'm hoping to, um, and I think once people see how I'm managing the cattle here and managing the land, they'll want to have me use their pasture rather than other people. So that's what's happening. So yeah, there's 40 acres over here on the river that's currently leased by somebody else that I've got my eye on, and next door here there's 11 acres, which I'm hoping to get some cattle onto at some point once uh, 
once we do a deal adjustment you only pay a few dollars per head per week for grass so there's not a lot of money in it for the owner of the land but then again the main reason they might want to have cut someone else's cattle on there is to keep the grass down otherwise they're constantly mowing like at the moment you have to mow every week here it just grows so quickly okay so what are these big white tubes uh, so we're looking at three rows here of tree guards so they're a paper tree guard with a little hardwood post holding each of them up and um, planting it's really an agroforestry design I actually engaged a, a local guy who's originally from Spain who has a I think his business is regenerative agroforestry but it's like the Spanish so it's regenerativa agroforesty or something and um, put together a plan for the place here because this place has hardly any trees on it that's very bare not a lot of privacy from the neighbors and not uh, any wind breaks or shade for the cattle um, so we keyline ploughed the whole place which is similar to contour ploughing to help the water infiltrate um, sorry I didn't but contour ploughing like what, what, what is that uh, so keyline ploughing is um, well contour a contour is like on a contour map it's like the uh, a line on a map that's the same level so we're roughly at the, the 10 meter contour here so it's those squiggly lines you see on those on those uh, forest maps mm -hmm. and it's just a, a horizontal so equal equal uh, what's the word I'm after altitude, altitude thank you um, and key line design is was actually discovered by an Australian farmer Yeomans um, there's a lot of Australian um, regenerative and organic agricultural pioneers over the years um, who are famous worldwide. One of them is P.A. Yeomans. He came up with the key line design uh, for farming. He wrote a book called Water for Every Farm and it's sort of a drought proofing by cultivation. So key line ploughing is putting a plough through, so a, a tillage implement, so just scraping the soil or cutting into the soil running across the slope. But you actually do it in a way that it's similar to contour, slightly off contour. So the water that's coming down the slope hits this um, groove in the soil that's perpendicular to the slope but it's actually pointing slightly downhill to the ridges so you actually run the water onto the ridges out of the valleys into the ridges and that's so we, we key line ploughed the whole place to improve the water um, retention on the property and then here we planted a belt of mixed natives um, in what you would describe as agroforestry uh, design so uh, to produce cabinet making timber and building materials and um, firewood over the years and provide shade and biodiversity and habitat and windbreak um, so we're looking at yeah a bunch of different uh, grey gum black butt uh, there's acacias and forest oak and river oak and a range of stuff here and we put all these in basically in one day which is good they're looking at about 200 trees here and putting another belt in on the other side of the property right now another 200 or so so this will, I think will add value to the property and give the cattle some shade and and one day provide building materials for people. I don't know whether I'll still be here by then, but it's a pretty well, low yeah, agroforestry. The time, the time scale for that, like what would you be, before you could start harvesting something you're planting here, obviously we've got little saplings just now, but um, like how long would we be, how long would you be looking at before that's even possible? Yeah, it's a pretty, agroforestry is a pretty low time preference um, endeavor. Um, so I guess some of these acacias you could use for firewood within sort of five to 10 years, but then the bigger timbers you're looking at 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Look at this tallow wood in here. So that's a big tallow wood over there. That's probably a hundred years old, that one. Yeah. The one that cows are scratching no, itself. way over, way over near the river. Oh yeah. A big tree. Yeah, so eventually some of these will be like that. Um, but yeah, that's not for 50, 60, 80 years. So. <laughs> how much longer have we got until all Bitcoin's more? <laughs> Bitcoin will be worth how much by then? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Do you want to tell us about this trailer? What is this? This structure here has is becoming famous in the area. Apparently, I've uh, dreamt for a long time about building my own cattle supplements trailer with a back rubber. So it's just a rusty old trailer which took months to find for 150 bucks. So I found the right rusty old trailer and then um, with my fairly poor welding skills added a frame and a roof and some tubs and uh, That's not poor welding skills at all. That's awesome. Thank you. It's surprisingly easy it turns out MIG welding and this is a call so the tubs are just for different supplements for the animals um, and it's a choice feeding a choice feeder they call it so they choose what supplement they want so they go in there and just take their pick yeah so the one will have salt and one will have limestone and another one dolomite and sulfur and copper and just some natural um, different remedies that might help their intestinal health or or whatever or might help them get rid of any worms that they might have 
and they do seem to somehow know what they need. So that's the theory with the choice feeder. Yeah. And then this bit hanging off the back here that looks a bit like a Hessian hammock is a back rubber. So it, and that's a barrel of um, some natural oil that has some citronella and other natural essential oils in there, which comes down this tube. And so this is soaking, soaking wet with. Um, smell that one. Oh, oh that's what it's like eucalyptus, no? Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. A, it's a mix of essential oils. So they come in here, as soon as I put it here they started using it, they get their head and neck under and rub rub under here and it, and it keeps this one, one of the main pests we have around here is buffalo fly, which is yeah, just like yeah, a small, yeah. smaller than a house fly. So you've got the, a tap on that at the moment? Yeah, or do you... I've just noticed the tubes come off, but oh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, I just turn the tap on um, for a few minutes every few days to make sure this hessian's soaking and then they come back in and they wipe it all over their back because they learn that it it repels the flies so maybe this will get me through summer the buffalo fly are only a problem in the summer and um, so it, far so good it's definitely working but whether it works to enough of an extent to not have to use a chemical treatment will depend on the animal welfare if the if they're actually because if the buffalo fly get very bad the the cattle get very annoyed they're constantly having to shoo the flies and they even can get wounds like open wounds under their eyes so it's, it's a it's a nuisance that can actually be really um, buffalo uh, problem. fly damage can be really bad it can make they can lose condition because they're so bothered that they're not eating enough and they can have open sores from these little blood sucking flies but they're only a problem in the summer and so far so good but if if it gets yeah we'll, we'll see if it, it works um well you know we've only got a month or two more to get through but if you have a, a week of really hot days then at the moment it's fine you can see some of them shooing with their tails but yeah there are hardly any so that's a big success so far yeah, sweet. Hatch, you got any questions? Yeah, well, did they originally just use it as a scratching post and then realise that it's helping them, or what? Can you do you know? Is it, like how do you how do you determine that? Yeah, I think they whenever you put a structure in the paddock, they'll come and rub their head and neck on it and stuff. I think that's. But as soon as I put this here, Rudy, the the big boy here with the white face, he just as soon as I put it here, just came in here and started rubbing his neck on it, and then and then the big bull I had on the place at the time came in and just parked it so this so this uh, bit of hessian is sort of hanging about a meter from the ground and it's hanging like a hammock might hang he came in and just put it over his neck and walked forwards and walked backwards this big bull is just walking forwards walking backwards walking forwards walking backwards he loves it they just yeah. instinctively they do it i don't know why that's awesome so sorry cell or sill grazing uh cell c-e-double l that's just one of the names um there are many different names for this approach to grazing um, like holistic grazing management and adaptive multi paddock planning and cell grazing, they all kind of mean similar. Well, some people would disagree, but they're all quite similar in the what you do is you run one herd or as few herds as possible and a high stocking rate, but for a short period of time. And then you move them on to fresh pasture and you give that grazed pasture time to recover. That's the, the common theme, the common thread among all those methods. So that's what I'm doing here. So these guys get moved every few days. Yep. onto fresh pasture and and when they uh, when the when the grass is getting a bit short they'll they'll tell me that they're ready to move by by mooing but they're all happily munching away at the moment yeah so what is uh, what does your dog think and your dog's name what is <laughs> Geordie Geordie named after Jordan Peterson he loves it here he loves farm days the best really yeah he doesn't like office work days very much very boring which I agree with so and they, they seem like very inquisitive creatures they're like just sussing us out and Cam. Like what are we like? Yeah, oh, they're calm. Probably yeah. like five or six meters away, and they're just they're coming towards us. Oh, oh yeah, they'll come. Oh, she's a bit. She doesn't like Geordie, so she's oh. trying to scare him away. Oh. Actually, so we probably, yeah, he'll he'll run away and cower soon. But um, yeah, they're really timid. I so I work with them every every day or so. So they're very quiet cattle. Not all cattle like this. You shouldn't necessarily go up and try to pat cows if if they're um they can be quite wild and quite dangerous yeah. but these yeah, guys are all pretty chill there's one right next to hats and he looks very nervous <laughs> yeah are she... you nervous about the long grass hats no no i'm okay <laughs> oh wow <laughs> oh man he's just taken after the dog that was awesome does he do, yeah, does he do that a lot she or she um, sorry she doesn't like geordie and she's <laughs> just charging him and i i once i was a little worried she might actually catch up with him uh, fortunately he's a pretty good runner so Geordie the dog was just yeah, sprinting away and now he's keeping a safe distance but she uh, she's not one of my cattle <laughs> and uh, she's got a real ca personality but 
Uh, yeah, right. And now at the moment that I've got their surrounding us, I think it could be some coordinated attack about, about to happen. <laughs> yeah, well, they're all headed that way now. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your sound grazing is good for both the, the cattle and for the land? Yeah, it's amazing. So um, one of the pioneers of what he called it holistic grazing management is Alan Savory. Some of you some, and some of your listeners have come across him. I'm sure, I'm sure Alan Savory uh, came up with this approach to grazing to mimic natural herd animal ruminant grazing where a group of wildebeest or whatever would keep in one group because they were surrounded by predators. So the safest place to be is in the middle of the mob so you don't get picked off by the predator. And that's how on natural grasslands, you know, historically the grasslands would be grazed and they'd stay as grasslands. Uh, yeah, the, there are benefits for the animal health. Uh, one of them, for instance, is breaking up the disease cycle. So if they have any worms um, and they shit on one area, then they move on to the next area, they're not eating their own shit, which uh, stops some worms getting worse. And huge benefits for the productivity, that's that's the thing, it's more profitable, you can get way more productivity. You mentioned stocking rates before, you can, you can actually stock even higher rates here um, if you're doing tight cell grazing because you um, you're on the steep part of the curve in the in the grass production so grass um, is it grows in exponential way yeah. uh, so it's an s curve the way the way by, by cells divide it, it, it becomes exponential so you, if you've always got your grass really short um, you're always at that slow part of the growth stage but if you've always got your grass growing throughout the middle of its life then it's the most kilograms per day of biomass getting sequestered so there's more photosynthesis happening so by using cell grazing you yeah, you're looking after the animals and you're improving your productivity so is cell grazing not actually the general adopted method is it is it fairly unique yeah the the still the main stream farming approach is still what you what you might call set stocking which is just to say okay we just run one cow every 10 acres and just leave them in there all year and it degrades the land it's clear as day uh, it degrades the land it means you have to rely on using uh, medicines for the cattle to kill the worms instead of just moving them onto fresh ground so that they don't eat the worms and the worm eggs that are in their manure is it is that method more friendly to say industrial farming or it's more scalable or something like what i'm trying to work out why people are doing that as opposed to something like this there's more people every day doing cell grazing and there are even some big commercial farms going that way especially in drier situations than here um, because they're seeing that it works but still I think it's still not taught at university and stuff set stocking still so uh, as to why well you do need more fences and you do need more watering points so especially on bigger properties fencing can be expensive and watering points can be expensive so uh, if you're having more small paddocks then yeah you need more fencing and more water points that they're the only downsides I can think of but some of those big cattle operations they only round them up a few times a year Oh. Um, and with my operation here, I'm moving them every few days. Yeah. So it's a different approach, but uh, it's gaining more and more popularity because it's just so obvious. So it also improves the land because you're getting all that organic matter what? and manure and nutrients back into the soil and trampled into the soil, and then you give it a big rest period. Yeah. Um, so Is it right to say like you, the more you see above the land, the more the, the longer the root system below the land? Yeah. Right. Yeah, and every every time you prune all that gr all that grass gets eaten off the top, then the roots prune as well. So you're delivering, but that's a good thing. You're delivering all that uh, carbon and sugars and nutrients to the soil profile to feed the microbes. So coming back to the one of the problems with set stocking is that you will have more worms in your cattle. So then you drench the worms. And the other thing, so drench is like medicine. You, you give a poison to the animal to kill the worms. And some of the more modern poisons are not as bad, but a lot of them still kill the dung beetles as well. So you have this, so with conventional farming, you end up in this chasing your tail situation where you're using more and more inputs. So you've got to use the drench because you're not managing your grazing right. The drench kills the dung beetles, so then you've got more manure in the paddock, so then you get more worms, so you've got to yeah. use more chemicals, and that's just the same. It's the same can be applied to, to vegetable production and, and grain production using conventional, in inverted commas, methods. They just seem to end up relying more and more and more on, on inputs, on synthetic inputs, and end up more and more and more in debt, and with less and less soil carbon every year. And this is the, I like to think, the opposite of that. So would it be fair to say that you're just trying your best to mimic nature? basically, and we're not cleverer than nature. <laughs> well, here we go, we've got a scratcher. Oh, yes. Uh, that what is this, what's her, what's her name? Uh, she's, um, I don't know her name, she's adjusted on here, she belongs to a neighbour, 
or a local a local professional cattle producer but yeah she's just using that back rubber but she's putting her head over it and pulling down which will test my welding again but anyway <laughs> <laughs> um, what was your question Hats? Um, it was what was my question uh, uh, mimicking nature mimicking nature, nature. Yeah, yeah yeah exactly so that's what the um, the the rotational grazing or cell grazing um, is based on that that natural process of grazing grasslands of wild animals with the predators so instead of predators keeping them in a mob we use fences to keep them in a tight mob yeah and ideally i'll be moving them every day um but that becomes a bit of a labor burden i move them every few days here but look at this pasture i mean look at all the different colors of yep. flowers a lot of these would be called weeds in you know, it there's some scotch thistle and and um some purple top and there's uh, paspalum and there's some Parramatta grass, that's actually a noxious weed. It's terrible stuff, but they knock it all down. If you get the stocking rate high enough, even if they don't eat it, which Parramatta grass is pretty not very palatable, but even if they don't eat it, they'll trample it. Mm. So everything gets an even graze. And another problem with set stocking is the opposite of that. They will always go back to the most tasty, most nutritious bit of grass and they'll hammer it and hammer it and hammer it to the point that it dies and you end up with a paddock full of weeds. And yeah. you can see it, it's you can see it in the paddocks as you drive through the country. Perhaps you'll see on your way home that some paddocks are full of fireweed, the yellow one. Yep. And, and there's just fireweed and no grass. Yeah. And it'll often be a horse paddock. It looks pretty though. I've dri driven past and go, oh, look at that, it's lovely. <laughs> yeah, but there's just no feed in there. So the, and, but so you can the, turn that around in you can turn that around in one season just by going cell grazing. Yeah. Well. And no fertilizers used, no herbicides used, just the animal impact and some fences and some water points. And they eat most of this, yeah? Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing that they're really not well, they won't eat the, they probably don't eat the fireweed or yep. the Parramatta grass. Okay. It's a pretty bad weed, Parramatta grass. It's uh, noxious. You, you, it's legally you have to control it somehow, and most people spray it, but it doesn't work. It just gets out of control. It's all about grazing management. I'm pretty confident I'll get on top of this Parramatta grass here. Isn't that one of those things you feel out in an airport? Have you been on a farm in the last so and so days? Because it isn't that, you know, potentially in your shoes and seed, like bad seeds and. Yeah, the bi I'm not sure exactly what one that is, but the biosecurity bi departments um, who I've worked with the Australian Federal Biosecurity Department a fair bit in my previous job, and they're just paranoid bureaucrats um, So, who like to find problems that they <laughs> yeah. want to try to control. And that can be, yeah, it's sort of simple. You see similar... Stay similar employed. Yeah, so they, that's right. Keep their job and don't be the one person who was in charge on the day that some terrible new thing arrives in the country but in reality looking back the most of the terrible new invasive species that have arrived in the country have been brought in by governments yeah. like the cane toad yeah. and the camphor laurel tree like and recommended by the government departments to plant them on your farm so <laughs> i don't have a lot of faith in biosecurity um laws yeah have you noticed um other than uh, two idiot podcasters rocking up and wanted to talk to you have you noticed as there been farmers local farmers interested in what you're doing there's already a pretty good movement of organic or regenerative or organic-ish farmers in the area. So yeah, I've very quickly slotted into a network locally. You, and in both ways, you go to see them and see what they're up yeah, to? Yeah, well, I volunteered on a couple of farms. So I help out other people and they help out me, but it's been amazing. It's just fantastic. If I ever need to do some cattle work or what, oh, there's always someone that can help and vice versa. It's just all uh, arrived at my doorstep. Um, Does that seem tend to be barter economy, essentially? You there's them. a lot of that around here. It's fantastic. Um, and in terms of of wanting to get out of large population centres and have that resilience at the moment, which I think is really important at the moment as we're seeing with all this COVID nonsense. Um, there's so much food here and there's so many lovely people who, who want to live a little bit out of the system as well. So, um, yeah, we're doing a lot of bartering eggs and venison and different types of beef and um, lamb and pig locally and and hay and, and swapping labour. There's sometimes people need to help with the harvesting a garlic crop or you know, in return for this and honey and there's all sorts of food in this area, it's great. So what would your advice be to the consumer, somebody who's living in a city maybe, because um, you know, that's where the vast majority of the population is, to in terms of, in terms of uh, what they should be buying, where they should be shopping, uh, you know, how they manage, how they get the best, the best quality for a value that's affordable for them? Well, I think uh, normally, uh, so pre-COVID, scamdemic I would have said um, buy certified organic and that's that's been my field of work for 20 years and and if you are still just going to the supermarket then from an environmental and health point of view and wanting to support good farming that's still the best thing that's available easily to you is to look for certified organic look for the logo and buy that but these days with um, inflation and supply chain interruptions and border closures and 
and shortages, and I think we're going to have more gluts and shortages with, with all more central planning tr planners trying to get involved. Um, I'm now suggesting that you find your local farmer. Uh, even in the major population centres, you don't have to go too far to find a farmer's market. Go to the farmer's market, meet the farmer, and then if the farmer's market's a bit far, just develop a relationship directly with, with that farmer. Find a cattle grower, find an egg person, find veggies, find fruit if you eat that stuff, mm -hmm. and um, support those farmers um, by buying direct. Okay, so um, water source. You have a, we're down the bottom end of the farm now, and you've got a good full dam. We've had a bit of rain here recently, so can you talk us through that and, and how important that is to your operation? Yeah, sure. So I'm so close to town here that I'm fortunate enough to have town water, but it is expensive and I don't want to use as much of it. So um, one of the things when you're looking at property is water. It's really important. Uh, water access and structures are sort of the three main things because they're really long-term things that are hard to fix on a farm easily. So water access structures. So I've got great access here. The water... I have I'm, a, sorry, I'm right saying you put some, you dug this out yourself? Yeah, yeah. So the dam, um, there was a natural little valley here yep. that wasn't yet blocked off in any way. So I it was asking to have a dam put in. And so I got some local earth movers and talked through a few designs and we put a dam in here. I actually don't know what the estimate in terms of megaliters. It's not very big, it's just a small to medium sized dam. It's only about two and a half metres deep in the middle. But yes, it's the first time it's full. So we built it in the winter when it's drier and uh, just in the rain over the last month it's actually filled up. And I will put in a little solar pump and pump up to a tank on the hill which I can then gravity feed back down to all the troughs. So we'll have water security here. And uh, whether, whether it, I think it's going to hold water pretty well. Sometimes dams can leak. It looks like it's holding pretty well. Um, for the cattle and for watering the trees in winter that'll be plenty. For commercial vegetable operation it might, it'll probably be enough for a small commercial veggie operation too. So uh, then we'll have the town water and the bore and the dam here so we'll be ha having stacks of water. So so right now to, to for, for water for the cattle you're doing that from the town water they're for on, yourself or? Yeah they're on town water now. And that's um, manual like you're having to Oh, oh I've got it piped in. in. I've got it piped in, yeah. I just put some poly pipe down and yeah. and actually all that stuff's so expensive. The fittings I spent six hundred dollars just on fittings, just on taps and elbows and joiners to yeah. put those troughs in. And not even the pipe the pipe's kind of cheaper. But um, the other good thing about having a dam is if you're going away for a week or two and you you, I'll put the cattle down on the dam. I'll keep them out of there most of the time, but if I need to know that they're going to have access to water because I'm away, mm. in case a pipe breaks or a fitting breaks or something, then I'll just put them in on the dam. Will they go in? Will they yeah, they, they, they'll walk in there. They stand up there to, the, to their belly and keep cool. And, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, that was great. Thanks, Owen. Uh, hot? Yeah, pretty muggy but, at the moment. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. still a beautiful breeze. Those cows uh, doing the little stampede. Yeah, yeah. The dog on, was uh, a bit, Geordie. Did a bit of a he run, was yeah. quick though, very yeah. quick. And that brisket smells even better. So, what's the connection between farming and Bitcoin? Why or, are we all regenerative organic farming and Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well yeah, make that distinction the, as well, and then pull across. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's a really good uh, distinction to make. Um, so farming is the ultimate low time preference activity like we planting those trees as we mentioned uh, as we were walking around like some of those won't be ready for 20 30 50 years so maybe i'll still be here maybe my family might still be here but even if that's not the case well at least there'll be a good resource here for whoever's here then um but even just raising beef like um nine months gestation and then another couple of years before you've actually got an animal to process so uh, there's similarity with there in terms of time preference. Um, how does Bitcoin relate to food? Well, well, and farming. Um, I've been thinking for a long time in working with, and I touched on it a little bit earlier in terms of conventional, in inverted commas, so chemical farming. So um, being high, more high time preference behavior because um, they're often in debt. Like, and I've, that was obviously a big problem to me for years. That farmers always seem to end up in more and more debt. Mm. But in a way, that's their sensible decision to make. Like, yeah, you might as well have a really reliable, fancy tractor if your debt, if your debt repayments, are, especially now we've got some mm. inflation. Like, it's you're better with, holding your money in a tractor than you are in holding it in totally cash. Totally at the moment, right? right. Yeah, but yeah. that that means there's this perverse incentive to get into more debt. Yes, and then you might be in a contract for seed or chemical supply. So then you're in debt, you've got to service that debt. So then you, you need to get a quick crop out of the ground. 
So you're constantly chasing your tail and that's just a side effect of, of the fiat money, the debt-based money system and uh, uh, causing problems in agriculture. Yeah. The, can you talk about the, the contract, seed contract, chemical contract? So a, a farmer's actually obligated over a certain amount of time to actually purchase Especially, well, they might in two ways. Yeah, they'll have supply contracts based on minimum order quantities. Yep. And uh, but also with some of the GMO crops, then yeah, you you agree to buy that seed from them next year, and you're not allowed to save your own seed. It's a bit of a Monsanto thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now yeah, Bayer, yeah, um, yeah, right. So, in your opinion, do you feel that? Um well, you obviously feel that your way is the the way, and not what other people are doing is maybe not right. But do so? Do you feel that the other type of farmer is they they know that what they're doing is incorrect? They're just but it's just that their incentives are misaligned, or they believe they're just trying to look for you know yield, and they're going after whatever they can go after. What, I think the, you're exactly right. I think it's the incentives. Um, it's uh, the misaligned leading to misallocation of capital, which is all a side effect of. Um, dodgy capital which is the dodgy money system so yeah and um, I, I think that well, well one there, there's this huge movement towards better farming practices and that really now farmer driven or consumer driven uh, well both. both yeah I guess demand driven but yeah but no no farmers want to destroy their land either but but if they're in debt um, or if they need to get you know a quick crop out of the ground or if they're thinking high time preference then yeah they start making different decisions which in my, from my point of view, is misallocation of capital. Um, wh- for instance, if you if you're in a bunch of debt because you got a really cheap interest on some sort of investment, like a big machine to put a big crop in, um, you're more likely to if it's a marginal year, like you've got you've had you haven't had heaps of rain. So I'm talking not country like this, but country further west where you're maybe in an opportunity. Co- opportunity cropping country so you can't irrigate for instance and so you have to make a judgment call uh, a certain time of the year whether you're going to sow a crop or not because it's going to cost you 100 grand or something to put that crop in mm. in synthetic fertilizers in seed in diesel cost in all of that cultivation labor all that's going to single crop yeah say yeah. yeah 100 grand for to put a wheat crop in or, mm-hmm. or something um, and if you've got a certain amount of water in the soil from reasonable rainfall that year, but you've got all this debt hanging over, you've got cash flow payments to meet, you're more likely to gamble. It becomes gambling um, and try to get a crop out, but, and then you don't get the follow-up rain you needed. So the better decision, if we had better capital and less misallocation of capital, the better decision might be to hold off that year because it's not a sure thing. To maybe only grow a wheat crop every five years after a really wet, summer or winter you know so different decisions are made and yes it's misaligned incentives and it's because the dollar system's broken it's not that they're bad decision makers they're they're trying to make their best decision but the but the the incentives are misaligned yeah does does that make your land more resilient to difficult years that we're in australia and australia has you know long periods of dry um so by by doing different like by doing that five-year period of you know waiting for the next wheat crop and doing something else in the meantime does that make your land more able to fight a difficult period of time because of weather? Because the weather is hugely influential in what you do. And yeah, you, can, you so, have no control over that. Yeah, so um, the, there's the, the terminology that farmers will use is like if you're flogging the land. Yep. And people who are leasing country generally flog it. So if you're flogging your land to try to get every crop out, you can because um, you're in a hurry, because you're in debt, then yeah, you're reducing the resilience and at the same time. And because it's someone else's land. Well, that's that's a whole, yeah, and that comes into private property rights and the important of pro- importance of private property yeah. rights. So yeah. there's a lot of this stuff that crosses over with farming. It's fascinating. Yeah, and it was actually I, I'd already I'd been thinking about it for a year or two, sort of 2017, 2018, how the money system is the root problem with with agriculture, and it was blowing my mind um, to think about all these different ways that some of them we've just touched on now about how the central banking and fractional reserve banking and artificially low interest rates have led to shitty farming practices and other stuff too, you know, uh, corruption and, and, um, and laziness and whatever else as well. But they though, those being the, the major things that have, that have led to it. And, and I'd come to the, I was pretty certain about that conclusion. I hadn't heard anybody talking about it. And then I was delighted to see at, uh, I went to Tone Vase's conference 
even I know he always just talks about trading, but but he's all right. I reckon he does. He he understands uh, the important stuff about Bitcoin. And he he ran a conference in 2019, um, unconfiscatable in Las Vegas that I was lucky enough to go to. It was great. I just met so many like-minded people. And Safe Dean did a presentation. It was the first one he'd done. He'd only just thrown the slides together, and it was how fiat money leads to fiat farming and food. Oh, and he wow. made the connection. I was so excited to see that. He, and since then, he's been talking about it a lot. Yeah. Um, the diet and farming method and yeah capital misallocation and time preference and how it all just all behaviors basically because you can you can relate this to everything like we're on a farm today but you could go into you know a library tomorrow or a you know a car yard next day and you could find this same problem it's the same problem um we just need to (laughs) misallocation of capital yes and we need to be able to we need to find different ways to communicate this to different people um well, you said that before. You've got to find the thing that resonates for that person. You know, it's not. It yeah. can, you can't always have the same argument for the different people. Uh, absolutely, because all you're doing at that point is telling your argument. Like I might have something I care about, and I want to tell that because it's important to me. But that's not what's important to the person I'm talking to. You have to find the thing that's important to them, and it's quite. I mean, you've obviously made the connection here. Um, so okay so is that your circle of people in terms of people that do stuff like you that you do or are you spreading that because you said there's other local people interested in he's having Geordie's the, over there having the, a nightmare. he's having a dream yeah sorry to cut you off that's <laughs> my dog's having a dream that's and he's so right. he's, going, yo, yo, he's, pro- he's probably yo. having a nightmare about the cow that chased him uh, yeah yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, when he wakes up you really can't tell if it was real or not it's funny he's just like whoa what happened then that's fantastic um, where was sorry, cut oh, no, sorry. So yeah, yes, the circle of people here. Yeah, there are people locally that are. Um, you said you're, you're you're talking to about Bitcoin, right? Yeah, so it so is a bit of you, an. Old... Are you trying to find their angle, or is their angle very similar to your angle? Ah, oh well. Um, uh, for for a few years there, I was just obsessed with Bitcoin and telling everybody about it, and running meetups and uh, running webinars and. Um, I wish I could have done more. I always wanted to do more articles and things. But fortunately, there's all these other people doing great work uh, now because I was too busy or too lazy or whatever. But so telling everybody about it, I've been through that phase and now I've moved on more to kind of just if people ask, uh, I'll let people know that I'm not going to argue with people about Bitcoin anymore. It's a waste of my time, Uh, maybe on fertile ground, if if you know what I mean. Uh, People who... Who are likely to maybe be interested for some angle and, and like you were saying brenda there's different different things interest uh different things about bitcoin interest different people and it's yeah. hard if you can if you see there's one little hook then i'll mention it to people and then but if they want to argue about it i'll just say i'm not going to argue about it but if if you want to know about bitcoin come to me and i'll, I'll help you um but and i've just been taking that approach locally and yeah there are a lot of people interested here um for different reasons because um, they're alternative thinkers anyway. They're, they're I think so, yeah. thinkers. Yeah, but um, it's interesting though because the yeah you, that's probably a positive and a negative. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So the people in the hills out here are just total conspiracy kooks. But then like people from the city will call me that. Yep. So um, there's uh, some of them are susceptible to all sorts of shitcoin scams too. So I definitely want to help kind of steer them. That's been one of my main things. Is just get people to just hold their private keys and don't be fooled by the scams like mm. that's the main thing don't try to don't try to trade everyone thinks oh you trade you say you're into bitcoin i don't say crypto but they go oh crypto are you trading i'm like no yeah um, but for instance i got my the guy who helped me with the design here for the tree planting i'm paying him in bitcoin yeah uh, he was in- instantly interested um because so, hang on can you, you yeah. offered and he said yes or yeah yeah okay. i offered yeah but that, that's that, that's it yeah. So I yeah I bought some honey from a kid that, and I offered both and he chose the Bitcoin. But anyway, so yeah, he was, yeah. Well, he was interested. He'd heard this and that about it, but just didn't yeah. never had someone to actually tell, to give him the no bullshit story about yes. Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. So we so I ended up organising for him and and his partner and a few others. <clears throat> uh, ended up organising because obviously the, the when you offer to pay someone in Bitcoin and it was a few thousand dollars, you know, the job. So it was a bit of money. Um, you also have to kind of teach them sure. to yeah. to hold it safely. So. Sure. So we ended up having a workshop here with half a dozen people where, and I did the full, my full four part series that I used to do, the what, why, 
when and how yeah what why how and when of bitcoin we did it all in one night over a bottle of whiskey and you did it did that at mara the first yeah, night, didn't you yeah or at least a couple parts i think i did the fair the um the what and and why yeah which yeah, is yeah. quite important stuff to me the economic stuff about the history of money and how Definitely. money works and so on to try to get people just thinking about it because you they're never going to understand it all in one session but at least to have some terminology and mm. some sort of frameworks like ideas like scarcity ideas like proof of work and so on but yeah so we ran through that and then they all ended up buying hardware wallets and they're all Bitcoiners now, which is pretty cool. And I'm paying him his his salary for work on the farm in Bitcoin. Awesome. And he's going to hold that for years. Awesome. So, so I mean, people yeah. wouldn't necessarily drive through where we are right now thinking there's a bunch of Bitcoiners in this nah. valley, right? Well, there I there plan- are Bitcoiners everywhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. And like organic farming, it often takes one person to start an organic farm Mm -hmm. Uh, I've seen this over the years because I've been to hundreds of organic farms through my work which has been great so I've picked up a few things and putting it into practice is another matter I'm still making lots of mistakes but um, often it would be the case that there'd just be one organic farmer in an area and these neighbours that all sort of you know tease him or say oh it's never going to work and whatever and all the usual stuff and spray the fence line and all the usual stuff Uh, but then eventually you start to see more pop up because they're looking over the fence and they're seeing that it's working Mm. so um uh, in a way, yeah, having one Bitcoiner in town, um, and I'm not as, as I was saying, I'm not as evangelical as I used to be about it, but people will still know to ask me um, if they need to know about it. And I think, yeah, I completely plan to, to orange pill all the, all the susceptible locals here. Yeah. Uh, and so far, so good. <laughs> and But that's the thing too, like just to be that person, which, which we said before, like you don't have to be evangelical or just bang on about it, but as long as your friends and family know you're the one to go to when they inevitably, every community inevitably needs somebody, will have to right? yeah 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 and you just have to be that somebody for your you know Circle. couple or yeah, yeah you know family or but it's amazing that it's always the same question about it's always the shit coins and the trading and and all this all the noise you know and so and yeah. i'm just brutal about it i'll just and just focus on those things like um hold your own keys and um and just buy a little bit at a time like dollar cost averaging yeah um which i did by the way for two and a half years i bought bitcoin every day yeah and that's the before only way Hass? before Hass? McCook. he's the daily dca guy you, uh you, yeah probably yeah. yeah yeah well i i introduced you to my mum before she's been in bitcoin the same time as me since the same time as me and uh, she was right there with me when I b- bought my first uh, Bitcoin. And it was a whole Bitcoin. We we both put in $500. Oh, nice and right. um, we bought a Bitcoin each uh, on Coinjar. And oh, you are I, me. This is this is my story. Yeah. <laughs> Except I wish I'd brought my mom at the time. That's uh, a, and, yeah. and, and kept the coin? I'd kept the coin. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I bought to spend. I don't know. Yeah. I, so at the time, sorry, this isn't my thing, but like, um, yeah, there was a. I like wacky, you know, I like risk. I enjoy it, right? And I. I, I don't. I'm, I'm totally risk averse, but carry on. No, I mean, I don't. I, I, I like to say gamble with, with, with risk, a small percentage of what I have, right? Because I, I find it enjoyable. I'm not talking going on the horses and, you know, picking number six. Um, but, um, but yeah, I was wanted to invest in a little business that was only accepting investment in bitcoin yeah right so that's why i bought bitcoin and i'm you know i actually still have some association with that first business it hasn't been huge super successful it wouldn't have gone up in it's value as much as the bitcoin certainly would have not done as well as bitcoin <laughs> you should have right? stopped at that uh, point of course of course but um but it's interesting the angles that people you know arrive at so it can, everything can come on from different directions well, i thought it was i thought it just might disappear like i just I had no faith in Bitcoin at that point, as as is perfectly sensible, I suppose. Yeah. When, you, when around that time, and and of course the the punchline to that little tangent story is that, that Bitcoin doubled and then we sold half. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. Of course, <laughs> we thought of course, we were great investors, and but yeah. well, at least you're you're better than the majority. But yes, it's yeah, not. It wasn't the smartest decision. Everyone right, has that like, story, I guess. But, but yeah. Um, see, I don't because I'm I'm late to the game, and and I've had hats to kind of go. No, 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 just buy and hold buy and hold yeah and dca like dollar cost average it's just but it's not it's not necessarily to get the best outcome because there will always be an example where oh you should have bought then and you Mm. would have more money now yeah obviously that unless you're extremely lucky then you might buy at the absolute bottom but um it's not necessarily about getting the best outcome but it's about getting some sleep and it's about avoiding avoiding panic selling and avoiding the fomo and nobody's immune to those feelings like you will feel the fomo when the price is going up and you will panic when well you you will likely panic yeah when the price goes down if if you're watching it so if you're just buying a little bit every day um price goes up you're happy 
price goes down, you're happy. You get more for your dollars that yep. day. Yeah, so yeah. it just manages that. You'll beat, that. by DCing, you will beat 70% of other people that are buying Bitcoin. Maybe, maybe more. But yeah. um, you're, you're never going to be the top 1%. You're not going to be the top yeah. guy. The top guy bought yeah. at the absolute bottom, which is pure pure luck. And there's always going to be that guy. Yeah. And no, that's only, But there can only be one guy. So you don't expect to be that guy. And just yeah. de- Everyone de- seems to want to try to, and I yeah. always... A good luck to them if they get that timing right but it's just there's a very simple strategy for building capital and and the benefit about that is that you become you become a more low time preference with your behavior mm-hmm. so yes. like i've always i've never been able to save money in my life until i found bitcoin and then i was saved like an idiot for mm. like, it, like totally. every dollar because you every dollar you think well i could spend this or it could go up yeah. i could buy bitcoin with it it might go up 10x yeah. Yeah. so it's this huge incentive to actually not spend that dollar which is how bad i was at saving that i needed to turn me into a saver yeah um and and in, and in doing so reducing all the frivolous expenditure and reducing um you you wanted to just go out and blow cash drinking or something silly like that just removed all partly it's just getting older i guess but all of that is gone from my life now that's a frog in the in the downpipe oh. Oh, nice. <laughs> I was talking about Welcome to the country. Can- <laughs> We've almost had some kind of bug or creature in every pot as well. Oh yeah, it's chasing yeah. me. This is the frog coming uh, after me now. Um, <laughs> can I just go back just um just a couple of minutes? You said that you're when you're talking to local people, um, you're trying to keep them away from the shit coins, right? You're trying to pr- protect them from the shit coins, and you're very much buy here, hold this. Do, how do they? How do they feel about that? Does it does that not come across as you being you know the pumping your own bag thing? And how do you how do you get the message across that you know what I'm doing for you is the right thing? Have you worked that one out yeah, yet? Because that's a different um, one, right? It seems to be if I go through the whole that's the whole course, like that four part course, or at least the first two, the what is Bitcoin and why, um, <clears throat> and talk about the scarcity and the supply rate. Like I get right into pretty complex. Um, economic theories like the difficulty adjustment like the um, price elasticity of supply and a lot of that people aren't going to necessarily recall but at least have terminology and a concept and I'll try to use really simple analogies like a broccoli farmer because especially if I'm in a vegetable farming area yeah um, and how if the price goes up they will plant more broccoli and then in six weeks time they got way too much broccoli in the price dumps i'm like that's price elasticity of supply and bitcoin is the first asset in human history to have a price elasticity of supply of zero yeah. <laughs> so i'm like go i i'm kind of uh try to emphasize some of that stuff and um talk about so it's hard to sum up um because initially at first look it's perfectly understandable that someone says oh well hang on this this shit coin sounds better than bitcoin like like I, and that does and they don't under, so so yeah focusing on the hash rate and the degree of decentralization and the network effect but it's hard to do that all in one yeah you can see the glaze time. appearing over somebody's face when you when you hit a topic that is just of no interest to them mm. i mean it is of it should be of interest but you're, they're not there yet so you have to find keep going keep or do you whether you have to i struggle this all the time do you have to keep going and trying to find their thing or should you just make them know that you're the bitcoiner and they'll come to you it's a bit of both. If you've got them in the door, or like over the line to the point where they're sort of interested or coming along. I mean, another one, which is just kind of like a trick, is to only recommend, I don't know if you're sponsored by particular exchanges no or one. anything on this. No one. Um, Hit us up. So, no. yeah. <laughs> but now's the time, Bitteroo. Um, um, is to recommend that they sign up for an exchange that only sells Bitcoin. Yes. Because if they sign up for Coinjar or something, the, yep. as soon as they go on, they're like, "What's this other Bitcoin SV? Uh, and yeah. what's all these other things? Oh, maybe I'll buy." It. And they and well, the, this Bitcoin something is cheaper. I'll get that one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, unit bias mm. comes in hugely. So explaining that that's divisible into 100 million satoshis is important. But yeah, that's one trick. Just cut them off at the pass with that, and just get them to sign up for Bitteru only. Yeah. And when they're setting up their Trezor, just get them to not ins- through that new Trezor suite. Uh, you can just not install the shitcoin apps. Yeah, or they okay. should do whatever they call modules that yeah so and then they hopefully might just not ask <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i mean not everybody has to be like you know most of us don't understand how the radio works we just understand that the radio works right so there needs to be somebody who invents the radio and there's other, other people that manufacture the radio but most of us will just go to the shop and I buy a radio that's well, the car mechanic analogy too yeah, yeah, well, yeah. So bitcoin's the same we yeah. need we need the people who understand it. i'm not the technical guy you're you know you're not the technical either but um no i mean either well not but, at all, yeah. but other people will, will see you as the one right because you're further down the road than they are 
So yeah, it's like that. You just the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's totally That's like the that. The mark of a wise man, though. The more, well, you, the opposite more, of the, more you learn, the more educated yeah. you are, the more you realize you're not. <laughs> right. That's the opposite of the Dunning Kruger effect, where you it tends to be people who think they've done very well in an exam that do poorly, poorly but yeah. people that think they've done not so well in that exam who end up doing well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And it's and only vaguely related to that, but like one of the things in terms of my travel, I, coming back to that part of the story, I was able to go to Bitcoin meetups all around, well, in a fair few different countries, uh, mostly just through Asia. Um, but, you know, New Zealand, Singapore, Bangkok, um, Hong Kong, Bitcoin meetups and connect with all these. And I would be, it, this would be a room full of the smartest people I've met in my life. Yeah. And I was wondering for years, where are all of the Isaac Newtons and where are the uh, Copernicuses of, of, and Goethe's of the modern age? Like where those people don't seem to exist anymore. Nobody seems to give a shit yeah. about where the world's going or think about how to maybe fix it. And then I realized they're the Bitcoiners. Yeah. <laughs> all this, and I would be the dumbest person in the room at Bitcoin meetups. And that's the way I love it. That, that's just fantastic. That and I miss that. Before I before I, I came to these, these things. Well, I saw only early enough to, <laughs> only early enough to see in the last um, big bull run, like 20, I guess late 2016 or no, in 2017 as well. And just all this the Bitcoin meetups just totally went to shit. Um, I didn't ask if I could swear on here, but I'm no, no, please. Um, where yeah, all these all these new get rich quick people would be turning up, and you'd, you'd get a hundred people at a Bitcoin meetup in Byron Bay or something, but they're all just like, I've got ten grand. Which shit? Which obviously they didn't call it a shit coin. Which, which coin should I invest in? Two hundred percent by at Tuesday a, at a Bitcoin meetup. Well, yeah, and then wow. it became called the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency meetup, and then it just oh. became called the cryptocurrency meetup, Ooh. and the people are and actually debating with it. Yeah, and then I was just like, "Fuck!" Because <laughs> there are people who made a stack of money out of Ethereum, and kind of well, if, you, if you make a stack of money out of these these scams, then there's a big incentive for you to kind of believe that it that it actually is going to do something. Well, this like is Ethereum. the gambler with the system, right? So any gambler that losing is right. not, losing isn't a problem really is a problem eventually but losing to begin with is not a problem winning is a problem yeah um and winning creates a system uh very commas and then a system encourages you to encourages you to double down and eventually you lose the house mm. um, and that's i think that's going to happen to the vast majority of people that do that um yeah and it, it's very dull to buy five dollars a day in yeah on a dca because it's not it's but it's ne- also but it's a totally the- proven winning formula yes just over. buy a little bit each day or each week or each month set it up automate it and wait mm. yeah yeah um all right do you want to tell us about your build beef better and regener eggs yeah yeah so um i i was kind of active on twitter and stuff but this all this covid stuff um uh, has and the farm has led me to kind of retreat a little bit, but yeah. So I have started a Telegram channel called Beef Back Better, which is uh, obviously named after the Build Back Better global communist agenda that uh, world leaders have been talking about, all uh, uh, coming from World Economic Forum. And uh, the level of coordination there is frightening. It is, right? it, uh, but ScoMo has never said Build Back Better, has he? Uh, oh. I'm not sure. I don't no, think but a, so. lot of, a lot of politicians peddle the same thing. They get, the their, same they get kind whatever of stuff, the thing is. And it's, it's all like, about the language and, and driving home the same. Your mum's just come in from the rain. Driving home that same message because, you know, we're all dumbasses and we need to hear the same words. I just found it interesting, like Jacinda Ardern over in New Zealand has used the words and mm. oh, Macron yeah. and Trudeau and all these guys are saying the same damn words, build back better. And it's just like terrifying global communist agenda um and we're on the same path here too and in australia in ways much worse than other countries that's so authoritarian totalitarian here at the moment um by virtue of geographic isolation here i am totally free but um the 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 government and the policies around that are pretty terrifying but we haven't actually heard the words build back better out of any of our leaders i think which is somewhat encouraging but yeah so beef back better is my telegram channel and if you want to reach out and make contact i'm not really very active on twitter or anything but if you do want to reach out i'd love to talk to you about farming um looking for uh investors established farmers and, investors um people who are already you know people who are interested in all, all of that all of that um and people who want to get a good beef supply or farming experience um i want to get an egg 
production mm-hmm. enterprise going here too. So yeah, my email is just a Proton Mail. Bill uh, beef <laughs> beef back better at protonmail dot com. Let's say that and again. Then what is it? Beef back, beef back better. better. All lowercase, all one word. Beef back better at protonmail dot com. And yeah, and then I'll add you to the Telegram group. We'll do some updates from the farm. Just uh, just little uh, snippets here and there of the cattle and so on. And you can uh, join the 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 supply co-op for the beef. And uh, anyone who's into eggs, I'm um, also wanting to start an enterprise here. Um, called Regener Eggs, which will be anti-lockdown chickens. They will never be locked down, even though you may be. <laughs> love it, love it. <laughs> but looking for fantastic. investors, especially uh, especially who want to pay with Bitcoin. Yes, awesome. <laughs> um, can I just ask about uh, your positivity? Like we see all this n- this this dystopian stuff happening everywhere, but then we also in the Bitcoin world you. You feel this any time you're involved, something feels positive, right? Um, so, I mean, are we going to win? That's my question, I guess. Well, we we are because we have to. Like, failure is not an option. And sometimes I get a bit despondent about that. And this year, there's been times because I was under this COVID shit really early, like in March 2020. I was like, hang on, these PCR tests—that's not what you're supposed to use them for. Because I knew about PCR tests because I've worked with biosecurity. Um, uh, and procedures for importing seed and stuff like that. Um, so I was onto this really early, and it, and it was devastating to see policies like COVID zero, like and stuff like. That. Oh my god, this is it was just and it's astonishing, astonishing to see how the stupidity peddled by um, our leaders and just by other citizens, like everyone. I, I I called it as mass hysteria in March 2020, and when I was in Asia, because I could see it. It was just this mood. Everyone was going mad. And, um, and I thought, no way would that make it to Australia. And then I come back in Australia and boom, just widespread mass hysteria here as well. Mm-hmm. And it was, yeah, terrifying because um, um, uh, we'd, we'd seen all these other things like Zika and horse flu and, and swine flu and all these things sort of come and go. And, and um, this one really caught people. And I even found it sort of caught me in a way. I was sort of worried too. Like it until uh, for a few weeks after a bit of research i was like no this is really not and then i got deep into it for about a year um when no one was really it seemed like no one was listening about this covid stuff i'm like no 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 this these are false positives like if someone's there's no such (laughs) if they're not sick they don't have a disease (laughs) this lab test is being misused and fortunately now there are a lot smarter people and more hard-working people than me who are really out there now spreading the word around which is so pleasing to see but coming back to your question about positivity um i think this is actually going to help bitcoin's cause and help us move towards a system where we don't because so many people every day there are more people losing faith in the institutions now and that's a good thing they were already corrupt they were already telling us crap ever since i studied agriculture at sydney uni where they were telling us to spend thousands of dollars per hectare using a lot of herbicide to spray out all the natural grass and then plant one species of grass and it'll pay off after 10 years of grazing and seeing it completely fail. So I've had distrust in institutions since then. Um, and now more and more people are, are losing trust and faith and looking down the path of liberty and hopefully capitalism and leading to uh, another phase where, where people have to take responsibility for themselves. And that line will line up very well with having a a good capital to use where we won't have these hugely perverse incentives um, created by, by the fiat money. But I, th- I still think it could get a lot worse before it gets better. Um, I don't know how it's going to play out. And that's why I'm here. And another part of being in the, obviously I can't stand being in major towns and cities now. I don't want to be locked down. I don't want to see all these people wearing masks around. Um, and I don't want to be susceptible to food supply interruptions, which I think is possible. So here there's food everywhere. I've got, guns in the gun safe a freezer full of meat and a generator don't tell anyone where i live (laughs) you got a spare room (laughs) i do if you pay in sats yeah Yeah, like i wish there was i have felt at times like i wish there was another world to go to i don't know if you guys have read um atlas shrugged no but i keep everybody keeps saying oh man it's fantastic like yeah Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand, yeah, Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand. She wrote that in the '40s, I think, and it's it's a cautionary tale about communism, um, and all of this has been thought about before. And mm. um, there's even there's a whole long spiel by one of the characters about what money is. It's fantastic. You got to read it. Yeah. Atlas shrugged. Um, 
without giving too much away, they, they create a, an alternative society. Yeah. Um, and they're able to hide. And all of the smart, industrious entrepreneurs go there. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd love to go there. Maybe it's here. Maybe it'll be the small towns. Maybe it'll be the rural areas. Uh, maybe we have to make them. Um, but I don't know how we hide. Um, maybe they'll leave us alone. Mm. Hope so. Yeah, there are some people who believe, some Bitcoiners who believe that sort of engaging with the current system and trying to bring them on side is the way to go personally i have an opinion we build elsewhere exactly what you're doing here build back um, better yeah, no, we build <laughs> actually our, build in, back better yeah, yeah. Though, yeah um but independent um people allocating their capital as they see fit and then let people come to you i don't think you integrate i think the integration time is long gone um i you know applaud anybody who's trying um, but as somebody who's, you know, worked in government for a long time as well, I, I, yeah, I am very skeptical as to. I don't. No, I'm not skeptical as other good people. There are good people, but whether they can beat the bureaucracy and the system, I'm very skeptical of that. So I just think people have to build um, projects like you're doing here and let people come to you. And that's the that's the the slow way, but it's the right way. So yeah it's low time preference it's That's a long it. game i think this the the agenda for for communist utopia will continue i mean it's been going for quite a while and as ayn Rand was writing about it in i think it's the 40s maybe it's the 50s um and but we seem to be getting towards the pointy end mm. um and the, yeah there's been talk in among bitcoin among bitcoiners about the citadel sort of idea which is fantastic um but it's kind of i think can it may actually end up looking like just rural communities like yeah. everything we need here is yeah everything i need is is within a few uh kilometers and um so the the regional areas are prime waiting for waiting to become the bitcoin citadels what was missing before was a good capital yeah and that all got screwed up because of the dodgy money so this time around and yeah, and ultimately it'll defund the the communists. It's just how whether they line us up in front of a ditch before that or not. <laughs> uh, yeah. But looking even pre Bitcoin, even pre uh, COVID, excuse me, you're looking at in Australia where we, you know, we are fires and floods. And actually, when it came to when shit actually hit the fan, both of those times it was your it was local people who helped you out. Like so, you would go stay at somebody else's house because your your house was in a fire zone, or you would you know somebody would come and help somebody else bail their house out or sandbag, or it was there's no government stepped in to come and knock your door and help you out, right? It was your local community. Absolutely, and that's very relevant here in the in the the fire. Well, we've had fires and floods, yeah, just in the last few years. Mm-hmm. Um, and the local community really got together, especially in both those cases. So, uh, sadly, with this with this COVID thing, it, it has divided the community. Yeah. Um, I don't know how that plays out, but mm. uh, we just uh, so far I've I um so far I've been quite pessimistic over the last couple of years about where things were going. Like where other people would say, "Oh, this will be over in a couple of months." So I was like, oh, "I don't know. I think yeah. it's gonna it's gonna be an, it'll be another booster shot and another variant." And uh, um and sadly I've been right about that in my really pessimistic um predictions in the sort of short term I've, i keep being right so i'm really trying to push them now because <laughs> i want to be wrong about my pessimistic um so i've my current prediction right now ultra pessimistic is that they're going to put the the you know double vax and then a triple vax requirement back in new south wales within the next couple of weeks i think they're going to do that wow. and i really hope i'm wrong <laughs> me too but longer term absolutely positive um because this is all part of it we have to lose faith in these institutions that are corrupt all right. so it's a great place to, one other thing I would like to do we speak about coming up in the car is like I just want to give a for you to give a shout out to somebody who is really in for it we're talking about doing this at the end of a pod and for the per, on an interview particularly to give a shout out to somebody who is super influential in your journey just just to support their work who, who would it one or two or who, is there somebody that absolutely pops up oh, damn I, I would it's Saifedean and I know that's so cliche no, that's... it is for so many people but I met Saifedean in 2019 and um and when he did that presentation on the connection between Bitcoin and farming, uh, that was just so, so, somebody, so great to somebody see. Somebody came along and talked to you about the thing that you were interested at interested in. Yeah. Oh, I'd already and been thinking about it. it was, you're right. It was okay. amazing. Yeah. So you're you're just gonna you're just a sponge at that point, right? Yeah. But fortunately there are people like him who are 
just working so just totally applying themselves to it fully and mm. just achieving so much so yeah it's cliched and it'll be many many people will also probably say safe team but yeah that's who comes to mind cool awesome all right we're gonna go eat some brisket oh Ooh, yeah man it smells yes. good love to it smells fantastic thanks thank Alan. you very much for having us thanks for having me Hey guys, if you made it this far, thanks so much for listening. Um, the plan with the pod is to do sort of guests one week and um, myself and Brendo the other week, so hopefully that's working for you. If you don't like one of them, just listen to the one you do like. Um, if you want a little bit more um, information from us, you can find it at uh, bitcoin-first.com forward slash learn.